Hey everybody, it's Jordan again and um, this is my second lecture on this module which today is about buoyancy and marine animals. Um, we will have a slot tomorrow um, to talk about this on Bongo so I've set it up today and come tomorrow with any questions that you might have and we can discuss buoyancy regulation in animals. If any of you are scuba divers, and I'm sure that you are, you will realise the importance of buoyancy and have been taught um, the importance of neutral buoyancy, which you aim for as a scuba diver. Now, being able to control your position in the water column is so important for so many reasons. For safety, for staying in a group, for looking at an interesting animal. Um, if you were not able to control your buoyancy and you shot up to the surface, you'd probably get the bends depending on the distance to the surface and how fast you're moving. But buoyancy is as important in marine animals. Um, for instance, a creature may want to stay at a certain depth to avoid a predator or to get a prey item or to find a mate. And so they have evolved structural and behavioral adaptations to stay afloat, just like in scuba diving, you use a buoyancy control device or fins or a dry suit to stay afloat or have positive buoyancy. Remember when we're talking about floating and sinking, okay, you float or you have positive buoyancy when you displace more uh, water than you weigh and you sink when you displace less water than you weigh. So we're going to talk in this presentation about animals and how they can maintain buoyancy using a bunch of different methods, the major methods I would say. And let's get cracking. So what problems do organisms face in water? Well, in terms of buoyancy anyway. Okay, so the density of fresh water is one gram per cubic meter, cubic centimeter, sorry. And the density of seawater is 1.025 grams per cubic centimeter. Obviously, the seawater is just a little bit more dense because of the salt. On the other hand, uh, many of the materials that make up animals, such as muscle, bone, mollusk shell, are more dense than water. So therefore, animals are going to sink unless they have evolved a method to stay afloat. Here we have a nice picture. I like just putting nice pictures into my slides that shows teleos fish. Teleos fish being the biggest group of bony fish. And they have densities between 1.06 and 1.09 grams per cubic centimeter. So you can see the problem that they face in terms of being more dense than seawater. So probably by far the most common um, adaptation for buoyancy in fish is the swim bladder. You guys have probably heard of the swim bladder. Basically, it's a gas filled bag or bladder. A, a fish will inflate it if it wants to rise and deflate it if it wants to descend. But did you know that there's two types of swim bladder? There's a more primitive form called the physostome swim bladder which is connected to the digestive tract. And in that case, the fish gulps air from the surface of the sea and uses that air to inflate the swim bladder. And it will also use its mouth to deflate the swim bladder. That's a primitive system, but it's very successful and it's still visible in most larval stages of fish and herring, eel, salmon, and carp. The swim bladder uh, has other uses apart from just buoyancy. For example, it produces these sounds called FRTs, which is, is kind of like a funny play on words, but um, yeah, it basically sounds like a fart. And <laughs> these are sounds that are used for communication and herring. The, this, this was discovered by Wilson, uh, Ben Wilson and Bob Batty here at Sam's. And they actually won a, an Ig Nobel Prize for this discovery about this additional function of the swim bladder. Ig Nobel Prize is uh, this silly ceremony. Uh, just Google it or YouTube it or something. It's ridiculous. Anyway, it's a, it's a ceremony that gives um, prizes to science that makes you laugh, but then makes you think. 
And despite the ridiculousness of this show, which is really like some sort of circus, there's some good stuff that comes out of it because it can be a science that really makes you think and leads to new questions. Okay, so there's a more, um, yes, say, um, complex or less primitive uh, swim bladder type, which is called the physoclist swim bladder. In that case, it's not connected to the digestive tract. Um, it's, it has an advanced gas gland, and this is found in perch, spiny ray, and spiny ray fish and other fish. So what does this involve and how does it look? Well, in this case, oxygen is produced and is transferred throughout the system. An oval actually transfers O2 from the swim bladder to the blood for deflation. On the other hand, a gas gland transfers oxygen uh, from the blood to the swim bladder for inflation. And where does this oxygen come from? Well, it comes from lactic acid. So lactic acid actually causes the hemoglobin to release more oxygen. And that retimirabil that you see there, the big red the kind of network of um, arteries, maintains blood acidification, lactic acid. So according to the root effect, that process is constantly um, causing hemoglobin to release more oxygen, which can result in the transfer of oxygen into the swim bladder. Eels do a bit of both, so they are kind of a combination of uh, physostome and physoclist. And uh, that's because they have a link to the esophagus and the retimirabil. That's a kind of beautiful more eel. I guess um, maybe some of you have seen that dive in in Scot Scottish waters. What do you do if you are a fish that doesn't have a swim bladder? And there are many examples of those. For example, flatfish and um, sharks and rays. And there's other types as well, like the, the largest bony fish in the world, which is the mola mola sunfish, as well as mackerel. There's a mackerel. There's an Atlantic mackerel. It's important to note that um, Many macro types or macro species actually do have a swim bladder, but the Atlantic one doesn't. So this has to keep swimming. And can you see any advantages of not having a swim bladder and being a constant swimmer? That's that's a pause. That's not going to give me any answer, but we can talk about that tomorrow. I guess the main advantage um, is that being a, being a fast swimmer, right, is, can be beneficial for so many reasons. It can avoid, it allow you to avoid predators or to catch a fast moving prey. In many cases, swim bladder can actually slow you down. So not having a swim bladder can be useful. And here's a picture of a shark um, using a, a float. Now these guys are constant swimmers. But as well as being a constant swimmer, there's other, um, uh, let's say, uh, mechanisms that this animal can use to maintain neutral buoyancy or positive buoyancy. And we'll come back to squalene in a minute. So fat accumulation is important. And that's because we know that fats and oils have densities less than one gram per cubic centimeter. So they're less dense than water. Having lots of fat can therefore help you to stay afloat. Some deep sea fish have less than 5% protein and have a lot more fat. Can you guys think of any other advantages of fats? Well, indeed, uh, there's oil droplets and fish eggs, and these can help to sustain the young fry early in their life. Uh, lipids are also so important for the growth and reproduction of animals. Um, and they can also be important for the insulation of marine mammals. So definitely sharks use fat and they have fatty livers. Fatty livers are used by many species, especially sharks, where it's up to 20% of the body mass. And in that case, 75% of the liver may be squalene, which is fat, and 
0.85 grams per cubic centimeter. So we're looking at something that's way less, a lot less dense than water and is very useful here. It's also rich in protein metabolites such as ammonium. And why is that important? Well, that's because ammonium is much lighter than other types of ions. Ions are important for metabolism and so many processes in organisms. However, some are much lighter than others. For example, ammonium is much lighter than sodium. So sodium will weigh you down and ammonium will give you lift. That could be really important in the deep sea where it's very dense um, and the pressure can cause an animal to sink unless it has good adapt adaptations. For example, the banded piglet squid has uh, a pericardium where 65% of the body volume is filled with protein metabolites. And similarly, the heavier ion, which is sodium, the concentration of that in the carapace fluid of this shrimp is deep sea shrimp is nearly 90% lower than in seawater. There's very high levels of ammonium instead. So what else can you do guys? I talked about lipids, adding lipids or adding lighter ions. What about modifying your shell or your skeleton? So if you have swimming muscles, those can hold you, hold you down. They can be dense. So you want to get rid of those, if possible. Um, reduce your heavy minerals by modifying your endoskeleton or your exoskeleton shell. And we'll look at some examples of that. So the density of bone is 2 grams per cubic centimetres. That's very dense and heavy. On the other hand, cartilage is about half of that. And so cartilage is found in sharks. And well, that's how cartilaginous fish get their name. So that's another ad adaptation they have, which can help them to avoid sinking and um, maintain positive buoyancy or neutral buoyancy. The top picture there shows the cartilage that's found inside a mako shark. And the bottom pictures show the, the bone that's found inside the sper sperm whale pan bone. However, there's lots of pores. It's very porous, so it's not as dense as it would be otherwise. And you could add lipid within the bone, again, to um, help uh, increase your positive buoyancy. Okay, so all these things are important to sharks, but something else that's important is the swimming behavior. You may often see sharks actually swimming with their nose pointing up. And that positive body tilt actually increases the total lift. So a lift is obtained from the pectoral fins and lift is provided by the tilted body. That actually copies quite well what planes do when they're flying. Interestingly, we had a seminar by Phil Anderson last year where he brought owls and birds, uh, birds of prey to the room to the William Spears Bruce room. And he was showing us how features of these birds are used to devise or to design um, underwater vehicles. Just because they are they work, <laughs> they're good features. So, so far you guys will have realized that we've only talked about the chordates, i.e. things with backbones and the chordata with an autochord. Let's talk about the uh, or other types of animals, for example, um, Nidarians. And here we have the Portuguese man of war. If you see the Portuguese man of war, um, just totally avoid it because it's uh, a dangerous creature. But what this one does is uses carbon monoxide to control its buoyancy, adding more carbon monoxide to go up and less to go down. And this animal here can actually migrate about 300 meters within an hour in the water column, up and down, by doing such a method. Another type of creature, again, is the cuttlefish, which is a mollusk, a cephalopod. Again, this creature here has a different method. And that method is a cuttlebone. 
what it will do is is it will um, add either gas or liquid into the cut into the chambers of the cuttle bone. If it wants to rise, it adds more gas and liquid, and if it wants to sink, it will add more liquid than gas. We've looked at creatures here, for example, the cuttlefish, um, and another thing that this does is excludes heavy ions, just like we saw earlier, but it reduces sulfate ions and increases chloride ions because chloride ions are much lighter. And you can see that having lots of sulfate here um, reduces your uplift quite considerably. So you want to get rid of that and replace it with something lighter. This is also done by uh, tenophores, cnidarians, tunicate sea slugs, and a lot of gelatinous zooplankton. So that's a good link. Um, we talked about zooplankton there. To this slide, here's a diagram that I got from a paper and I like it because it shows the difference between what we call the viscous world and the inertial world. These are two worlds that exist in the sea um, depending on and you live in what, which one you live in will depend on the size you are. So in the viscous world um, the environment or, or their life is kind of governed by viscous forces so the environment's very sticky for them and um, it's more laminar flow. On the other hand, if you're really big, you can kind of move through the water with a bit more ease. And that's a turbulent environment. So low Reynolds number, at low Reynolds number, which is what you encounter when you're very small, drag is dominated by viscous forces rather than inertial forces, which you might have learned in physics. Sinking rates can be very slow. And we're talking here about phytoplankton and cyanobacteria such as the different types you can see here. So these small creatures actually have a benefit in their size, an advantage. Smaller bodies mean higher surface area to volume ratio and higher drag. So therefore, because of higher drag, therefore a lower sinking rate. If you're a large diatom, you sink faster than the smaller ones. And so you find larger diatoms in more dense water. Warmer waters typically are, are smaller, uh, contain smaller cells. And you can have spikes and protuberances um, on your body, which definitely increase the drag. And that can help you from sinking. Another uh, use is this shape. And that's because elongated shapes generally sink more slowly than round shapes at about the same size. And that arrow worm might benefit from that because it has an elongated kind of long shape. So we're looking at being elongated and being small. Those are useful for phytoplankton. Let's talk about zooplankton a little bit. And I just had to show this because these are my favorite animals. Arrow worms. And I studied these three species in my PhD. In the Arctic, the first species there, Eucroni hamata, has this oil vacuole filled with wax esters. Wax esters are very energy rich lipids that can get you through the winter time. The oil vacuole in the body is positioned right in the middle of it. You can also see that here. And so that's why Pond 2012 suspects that it must have a role in uh, buoyancy and in tilt. Otherwise, why would it not be in another place in the body? Something different from that though is the swim bladder. And that's actually positioned in the body in the more upper half of the fish because it would be heavier in the lower, in the lower, uh, the lower part of the fish is heavier. So Another type of copepod is uh, Argyplankton is Calanus uh, femarchicus and the other types of Calanus copepod. I think I've talked before about just how important these animals actually are. They, they, they pretty much are the reason why many birds, fish and whales travel massive distances every year to feed on them in the Arctic. It's because they're packed to the brim with fat supplies, wax esters and it's a, it's a premium kind of steak of the oceans. Uh, we, we joked about it being McDonald's of the oceans but it, because it's filled with fat, but it's good fat. It's the kind of fat that animals want to eat. High abundance, high biomass. 
You find this in Loch Etiv as well, which means that we can study these animals on our doorstep. Calanus vermarchicus can be studied here, but it's moving north with climate change. So we're also, let's say, chasing it to the Arctic. The wasp waste in the food web just means that it's so important to everything above it and below it. But this has this oil sack. And it is a it was a conundrum for a while. If it's got this oil sack, um, and it relies on that oil sack, it relies on it because it uses the oil sack to um, survive in the winter time during diapause when it's in hibernation in deep water. It needs these lipids to survive in deep water in winter. However, they're less dense, or they should they be expected to be less dense in water. Therefore, why does the animal? How can the animal stay down in deep water? And that's that's uh, been kind of um, solved recently by Dave Pond, who found that at depths greater than five hundred meters, so diapause depths. The lipids actually become solid, so they change from being liquid to solid and become like a weight belt that allows the copepod to stay down. And then later, um, they can come back up again to feed um, in the springtime and in the summertime in surface waters. That's going to be at a time when phytoplankton are kind of increasing in the surface and the copepods will come back up to eat them. How they get back up there could involve changes again in the lipids or the use of ions. So we talked about a lot of different or several different methods to change your buoyancy um, or to um, avoid sinking in an environment where you would naturally sink unless you can do that. But there are costs to that. For example, the metabolic costs of accumulating fat, wax esters or squalene the cost of building and filling a buoyancy aid like a swim bladder, the added cost to a shark or a mackerel, um, you know, of just constantly swimming, or of an animal that does have a buoyancy aid, such as a swim bladder, of swimming, the cost of generating lift while swimming, um, that's difficult and less efficient, and then the cost of generating lift by flapping the pectoral fins. There's definitely costs associated with these um, different methods that you can use here. So the alternative is that you do nothing and that might actually work for phytoplankton. So they're small enough. They want to be in the surface because they want to be close to sunlight and have lots of nutrients around them. They can actually rely on mixing and resuspension to stay up in the surface layers. For example, Langmuir circulation. In the euphotic zone, Langmuir cells aid flotation. And in prolonged calmness, heavy cells may sink out of the mixed layer. Upwelling and downwelling processes. So just to summarize, guys, main kind of buoyancy tools are gas-filled spaces, um, such as your swim bladder and your cuttle bone, um, swimming constantly and um, having your nose pointed up when you're swimming, the use of lipids that are less dense than water, um, modifying your shell or skeleton to, for example, contain more cartilage and bone, or using ions that are heavy, that are less heavy, and uh, more light, to uh, help you maintain neutral buoyancy or positive buoyancy. Surface area um, is important as well, and the size and shape of an animal really makes a difference. Or you can rely on your environment to get where you want to go. There's some references, guys. Um, some very good papers here, for example, the first one, which has summary, summaries of everything we talked about. There's loads of good YouTube videos on this stuff too, and it might come up in the exam, so it might be important. Um, and yeah, we can chat tomorrow, and let me know if you have any questions prior to that. Otherwise, I'll see you tomorrow. All right, guys, have a good day.